Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. I'm Judith Rosenbaum. I am an assistant professor in mass communication and I was also asked to coordinate the health disparities research community. Um, I'm really excited you're all here. I thought there was going to be two people and there's all of you so I think that's really neat. I want to thank you all for taking the time out. We're going to try to keep it short and sweet um, so that you can go about um, your day. Um, before I start talking specifically about the research community, I want to talk a little bit about the bigger project that we're a part of, just to give you an idea of where we kind of fit into um, the RIMI project here at ASU. And this should work, and it does. Um, we are part of the Research Infrastructure in Minority Institutions. It's um, part of a National Institute of Health. Um, our principal investigator is Dr. Freeman. And the project that we fall under has four goals, some of which relate to what we as a community will be doing some of which don't. Um, obviously the first goal, very relevant, to develop a critical mass of faculty who are engaged in basic research in health areas addressing minority health disparities. Um, another goal is to render basic research in health disparities self-sustaining. That translates to grant writing. Um, another goal is that the principal investigators on RIMI projects We'll conduct their activities as planned, evaluate their progress as required, and we'll strive to achieve the stated research objectives as well as the RIMI program objectives. And finally, another goal of the RIMI project is to improve underrepresented student achievement in health disparities research. So how are they going to realize all of that? Well, they've broken the RIMI project down <laughs> into four cores. The first core focuses on students something we won't be having a whole lot to do with per se, but it, it's interesting to know. Um, their goal is to build national research infrastructure by graduating the next generation of health disparity researchers. Um, this is where we engage in activities like peer tutoring, GRE preparation workshops, grad school prep workshops, they bring in um, speakers, they do things about curriculum development, they focus on research methods just to get our student body ready to become us in five to ten years. The second core under RIMI is what we call the facilities core. But this is run by um, Brandon, whose last name escapes me. Walker. Walker, thank you. Um, he does things at the biotech lab operations. He organizes skills workshops, so if you are in the natural sciences or do stuff related to the natural sciences, you can take part in those workshops. He organizes brown bag lunch seminars every first Friday. Um, they work on establishing collaborations with people inside and outside of ASU, and they also do lab tours. The third core, <coughs> the um, third core that we focus on is the administrative core. Their goal is basically to make research possible. They do all the things related to money and policies that I really don't know a whole lot about. I'm looking at Missy because I have the feeling she might have something to do with that. They take care of operations, accounting, writing policies, um, making sure that we do advisory board meetings, we're staying within federal regulations. They pave the way for us to do our research. The final core, the final core is the research core. That's the core that our community is going to fall under. And its goal is to build a body of biotechnology and health disparities research. This, goal, this core is really broken down into two activities. First of all, there's the <coughs> DNA Methylation Detection Research Project, which is run by Dr. Seh Seheb and Ms. Patterson. Um, they do presentations on this. If you'd like to know more about it, you know, talk to them. Another part of the funding goes to us, the Health Disparities Research Community. Our goal, of course, is to build up health disparities research. <coughs> so this is how we fit into the RIMI project. So if you ever get emails or see things about RIMI, we kind of fit into that very fourth final core. Um, we've developed our own goals and objectives, and what I want to do now is, is I spoke to most of you about this, or you've seen the email, but just to kind of get everybody up to speed, I want to focus real quickly on what our objectives are, what our goals are, and what we're going to be doing, just so we're all on the same page. Um, we have two major goals. Our first core goal will be to form and maintain a community with research interest in minority health and health disparities. The, the key word here is community. The reason you all are here 
is because you're interested in doing research into health disparities. You, you may have done research in the past. You may have some really cool ideas. But what we really want to do is form a community. I mean, I don't know about you, but I usually teach five and five. If I'm lucky, it's six and five. And so the only way I can do research is to work together with someone else. You know, I'm sure we all relate to, like, yeah, I teach summer too. The only way you can publish is if you work with other people. And it's really hard to find other people when you're teaching six classes and you have office hours and grading and advisement and, every, and service and everything else. So what, what we really want to do with this community is give all of us an opportunity to find out, hey, you know, what is Dr. Mason doing? Could we collaborate? You know, could we work together? Um, what, you know, what are we all doing? We want to form a community and help each other with our research and be successful that way. And that's kind of where our second goal comes in. So we want to form durable collaborations between ASU departments, but also with outside institutions. There's a lot of institutions in Southwest Georgia that focus on health disparities. And um, Dr. Handwork is going to be talking about that in a little bit. And I mean, why not? use our research abilities to help them out and use their facilities to help our research. You know, there's no better way to get grant money than to collaborate with a local practical initiative. And there's a lot of those out here. And if you're like me, you're probably going, that's cool. Who are they? You know, and the goal of this community is to introduce you guys to those people so that you can talk with them, figure out, hey, what are they doing? Where can I fit in? Do you want to write a grant together so I won't be teaching five and six and I can do my research? And that's our second goal, is to see how can we basically create a network and put ASU on the map as far as health disparities go. Because if you look, if you're familiar with health, health disparities at all, Southwest Georgia is not looking really good. And we have a real opportunity to really set up a center for health disparities <coughs> research. But in order to do that, we need to have our research together. We need to have our grant running together. And that's what we want to do with our community. So these are very lofty goals, you know, very big. We broke that down into um, five simpler objectives. Our first objective is to integrate health disparity topics into the curriculum, and particularly into science, technology, engineering, and math courses. Um, to get, you know, when you teach a lot, it helps sometimes if you're teaching and your research overlap. And it also, this again, ties into, remember that other core, that student core, to graduate the next generation? of health disparity researchers, so two birds, one stone. Um, another objective is to provide the skills necessary for successful grant writing, research, and publication. We all have our PhDs. We've all done research. We all kind of know how it's done, but the knowledge might have slipped away. We might have not used it for a long time. I know I haven't, as far as grant writing goes. And, you know, let's, let's do some workshops. Let's figure out, you know, what can we, how do you write a grant? What do the successful grants look like? What do they need? How do you get your dissertation published? You know, if you're like me, you've been sitting on this dissertation and you're thinking, yeah, I can publish this, but I don't know where to start. Well, that's where the community comes in and we, we hope to help you with that. Objective number three, secure external funding for cross-disciplinary minority health disparity research for two projects. You know, we said two, if we can do 10, that's awesome. But we figured, you know, these goals go to like the NIH. Let's keep it small. So, you know, let's see if we can get two projects funded, started, and going. That would be awesome. You know, that, that would be great. Another objective is, and again, you know, we had to pick a ballpark number, publish 10 papers on health disparities topics. Hey, if we can publish 25, that's awesome. But let's shoot for 10. And if we work together, I don't see why that's not possible. You know, if we, we all put our, our brains together. And our final objective is initiate two new health disparities research projects with external collaborators in the next two years. So again, we're going to talk to people outside of ASU. You know, things like the Cancer Coalition, um, Public Health here in Doherty County. Who can we work with? Can we initiate projects with them? Can we get a grant for that? That's our final objective. So how are we going to realize that? Well, I think you all received, or I hope you did, the, um, the schedule. And we're going to be holding a whole bunch of, of workshops and seminar. You guys just received the schedule for this semester, but we're going to continue on next semester as well. So you're going to be getting a whole bunch of workshops and seminars. Um, we'll be doing two seminars on actual health disparity course materials. So if you're interested in incorporating health disparities 
into your courses. We'll be organizing one at the faculty conference in August, and there will be another one in the fall. You know, because there are procedures you have to follow officially, especially if you teach a core class. You can't just like, hey, change things the way you want to. So we'll be, we'll be organizing that. We'll also be organizing four workshops on funding and grant writing. It's actually the, the first workshop we'll be doing in two weeks is funding. You know, what's out there? How do you write a grant? How do you do that? What, what, what can you apply for also? We'll be doing four workshops on post-award issues. Things like how do you manage your money, your people, your time? What kind of policies do you have to you know, adhere to? All sorts of things that I'm not familiar with, but I hear are very complicated, and so you better be aware of them before you write that grant. Um, we'll be working on research publications. You know, how, you know, I know we all know how to write, but how do you get it published? And we have some people here who've taken summer courses on that. Um, Dr. Dean will be sharing her knowledge about that with us in a couple weeks. Yeah, how, do you, how do you get started? We'll be doing workshops on data analysis, both quantitative and qualitative. You know, I know most of you are probably familiar with some form of SPSS, but it might have slipped with me. It's been a long time. And it helps to have somebody go, this is a multi-level linear regression analysis. And for you to go, oh yeah. You know, find who's an expert on what. You know, and, and know who to ask questions. We're gonna be doing workshops on current health disparities research, what's been done, what's out there. You may have an idea of what you wanna do. Maybe it's already been done. You know, it kinda helps to know what's out there. We'll be talking about outside institutions. That'll be the very last workshop this semester. What are the local organizations? You know, we'll have them come in, give a presentation. Um, and a workshop publishing from your dissertation. We will also provide, create an online space. I know we all have service classes a life, so you may not be able to come to every single workshop. So I've been working with ORSP to create a website where we can put the slides in case you miss it. If we can't get a space on the ASU RAMs, I'll build a wiki. You know, I've done QEP, so if we're all cool with that, you know, we can do that. But we'll have a space where you guys can go to just see what we've been talking about. And we'll be doing monthly brown bag lunch meetings. Brown bag means you bring the lunch. <laughs> we don't have money to buy lunch for everybody. Um, but basically, this is, you know, second Friday every month. You come in, you talk about what you've been doing. It's kind of going to be a little bit of an accountability meeting. I don't know if you're like me, you have these great plans and then they don't really happen. Sometimes it helps to announce those great plans and then have to report on it the next month. Officially, our first brown bag meeting would be this Friday. I was thinking that might be a little bit much, so we're going to start in March. And I'll be sending you all an email. You know, it's come over, bring your lunch, we'll just kind of talk about things, talk about your ideas, exchange thoughts, ideas, whatnot. Very informal, but just to give you, you know, just for me it would be accountability, but maybe for you to get ideas or inspiration, find out who's doing what. Um, that is basically the, um, you know, the foundation of what, what we would like to do with this community. Um, you've received this schedule. You know, I, I will be emailing this to you until you're like, please stop emailing this to me. I'll probably email it to you about every week. You know, just to remind you, because I know I'm like that, I need a reminder. Um, what I want to do now is I want to pass the microphone on to Dr. Handwork, because we want to talk about health disparities a little bit. I know for some of you, the topic might be completely new, or you might be old hats at this, I don't know. But um, in case you are, bear with us. In case you're kind of unfamiliar, we, Dr. Handwerk was nice enough to bring a whole slew of information that you can collect after the meeting. And she'll be giving you just some basic insight about the what is it, what do you know, what can you do. Well, you can tell um, by looking at me that I've been around the block for a while. I've been in the business for a lot of years and I've been in health and I've been in disparities and I've been in health disparities. But I wanted to start by telling you two stories that were those aha moments for me that changed the way I looked at health and disparities and health disparities. The, <clears throat> the first one when I was living on the, um, in upstate New York and I lived just outside Seneca Falls in Seneca County. 
They had a, a, an army depot there, but it was a very rural, very poor county. And one of the health planners for the state, this is back when they still had health planning agencies, came to me because it was running a Planned Parenthood, and they said, there's something going on with the data in Seneca County that we don't understand. This is a poor county, the economics are terrible, the education is terrible, and we can't figure out why they have fat, healthy babies. Now, fat didn't mean what it means now, but back then, fat was good. Fat, they have fat, healthy babies, <clears throat> and we can't understand why, because all the other counties around that have the same bad stuff going on have terrible pregnancy outcomes. So we started to look at the data and we drove around and we started talking to people. They had no doctors in the county. They had to travel outside sometimes 60 miles to Rochester or Syracuse to get to see the doctor. And after about six months, what we figured out was that there was a very large Mennonite community in Seneca County. And the women used midwives for their birthing decisions. They didn't drink. They ate healthy, uh, ate a lot of what they grew themselves in their gardens. And they had almost no bad vices. And that's why the overall stats for the county reflected that the babies were healthy, even though every determinant that might lead us in the direction of these are terrible things that are happening here and these babies should be born sick and, and we should have worse outcomes. It wasn't true in Seneca County. And I went, hmm. Sometimes those disparities hide in places that you never thought to look for them. The second story that I'm going to tell you is one that happened here. And it happened soon after I came. Um, I was working with the Community Health Institute and we had funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Woodruff Foundation to try to understand how to improve health in this region. And I had many moments of understanding, but we looked at Lee County and Terrell County as part of our health planning. And those two counties lay next to each other, but they are so different in all of their outcomes, in all of their, their determinants of health. And how could these two counties be so different from each other when they lived right next to each other? So those two things really helped shape the way that I thought about health. And then there was one more other thing that happened to me just when I came here 20 years ago. I heard someone talking about the parable of the river have you ever, has anybody ever heard about that? Well, this is a little story and nobody knows where it came from. It's one of those things that's been around for a long time. There was a man and he lived on the bank of a river and he fished and he hung out on the bank watching the water go by. And one day when he was sitting there, a man came down the river and he was floating in the river and he was yelling, help me, help me. And so he jumped in the river and he pulled the man out and the man said, you saved my life. Well, that made him feel good. And the next day he was sitting by the river and man came down, floating down the river again, yelling, help me, help me. And right behind him, there was a woman floating down the river yelling, help me, I can't swim. And he jumped in and he pulled them out of the river and he saved their lives. Now he felt really good. Well, before long, every day when he was sitting by the river bank and fishing, more and more people came floating down the river yelling, help me, help me, I can't swim, I've fallen in the river. Um, and he couldn't save them all. So he started getting his friends to come and he, he got them to help him pull people out of the river so that they wouldn't drown because there was a rapids down the river a little further. And soon his friends couldn't handle it. And then it was winter time. And so they built a building that they could to get these people out of the river and take them into this building. And they called that building a hospital. And every day they were saving more people because they learned more and more about how to help these people that were in the river. And pretty soon they attracted attention from people all over the world. And they knew that there were people in their rivers too, and they didn't know what to do to help them. So they sent 
somebody from another country far away to come to talk to this man by the river and find out how he did what he did so he could go back home and do the same thing. So he's watching him and the man is, the man is explaining exactly how he got his friends involved. And the man said, you know, there's only one thing I don't understand. Why are so many people falling in the river? And further upstream, <clears throat> they discovered that people were fishing by the side of the river, but there was a big cliff. And if they moved the wrong way, they would fall off that cliff into the river. And in that community, there was no place for people to learn how to swim. There were no doctors that could warn them or public health people who could warn them of the dangers of sitting by that cliff. And you know that? really changed the way I looked at health and I looked at disparities. We put our money into big machines and technology and we have done a wonderful job pulling people out of the river and saving their lives when they've got cancer and heart disease and strokes and diabetes and any other number of things that we know kill people. But we don't stop to ask the question, why are they falling in the river? And that changes the way that we look at health disparities. And I admit again, you can tell from my gray hair that I'm a child of the 60s, so we're a little different than everybody else. If you grew up in the 60s, you have a different outlook on life. You also know that sometimes when you can't figure out a problem, when it seems like you've gone as far as you can go, what you need to do is expand your mind. And people since the 60s have changed it to thinking outside the box, developing a new paradigm. You know, there's all kinds of phrases every decade or so. We have a new way of saying the same thing. So what I'm challenging you today to do is to, whether whatever decade you're from, whatever resonates with you, whether you're going to expand your mind as you think about health disparities or you're going to create a new paradigm or think outside the box, I want you to think about health and disparities in new ways today. And we always want to get to why are so many people falling in the river? Because it's much easier to deal with helping people not fall in the river or teaching them how to swim than it is to pull them out and save their lives when they've gotten way down the river and they're going over the rapids. So um, I don't know how to change these slides. I'll be this slide person, how's that? Good. So I, I wanted to start off with some things that will both get us in the same book as well as encourage us to think about health disparities, maybe in new ways or in a very expanded way. Health disparities aren't only because of, uh, aren't only about having an insurance card. If we really want to understand why people are falling in the river, it doesn't have anything to do with having a health insurance card. The World Health Organization says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. Now, I've also seen people put spiritual well-being in there in terms of making a, a person whole. And then disparity, breaking it apart into its two pieces, um, the CDC uses a definition of differences in health outcomes, and that outcomes is an important piece, and determinants, what causes the people to fall in the river between segments of the population as defined by social, demographic, environmental, and geographic, which has an extra R in it, attributes. So some of what I brought over here for you fits into each one of those categories, social, the relationships that we have with each other and with the world around us, environmental, and environmental means not only what's in the soil and, you know, do we have a green home, but it also means the things that we surround ourselves with. Uh, and geographic attributes, whether we're looking purely at geography of where somebody lives and how that affects their accesses to, or their access to the resources they need. Or geographic means, do they live urban? Do they live rural? I learned a new word this year, rurality. Um, the federal government loves the word rurality because it defines not only um, 
towns of under a certain size, but it describes how people live too. So two different kinds of geography. And then along health, we can go from awareness all the way to death and, and what comes immediately before that. There are so many places where we can intervene to save people's lives, to reduce the disparities that exist. We can start with just creating awareness that there are disparities. We can do research in how to get the message out to people, to make the message actionable. And we can educate people in ways that are culturally relevant and sensitive to them. Getting outside our own skin and, and understanding how they can receive information and make it work for them and make it meaningful to their lives. Access, lots of ways with the Affordable Care Act now to look at access. And I, I did a presentation one time on access is in the eye of the beholder. We look at access from the outside and we look at what has happened. Here's one more quick story. When I was at Planned Parenthood, we were having a very difficult time in upstate New York attracting minorities, and we all kinds of minorities. And we wanted to bring minorities into the clinic. And so I met with my clinic managers, and I said, w w what's the problem? And they said, well, I don't know. Let's do a survey and ask the people that come into the clinic why minorities aren't coming in. Why are you asking the people who are there why the people who aren't there aren't coming? Don't we need to go out and talk to those other people who aren't coming in? And what they told us when we got out there to the communities and we sat and talked to them, what they told us was, if I don't see my face when I walk in the door, how do I know I'm home? So that was another one of those aha moments for me that said, Access is defined by the people who don't have it rather than the people who do. So we can't look backwards to understand access. We have to look forwards to understand it. Navigation. Boy, I had a, a, a recent health incident. There are new words I didn't even know, I never heard of before. I had a condition that I never heard of. Who knew it existed? And suddenly I got it. And people are using words that I never heard of. How can we help people understand the system? People, especially people who are outside it or who have had bad experiences or people who come from someplace else. And this system, well, Albany is different than Thomasville, which is different than Atlanta and the United States, which is way different than other places. How can we uh, help them understand how to move around that system? The words to use, um, how to talk to people to get what you need because their experiences may not have gotten them what they needed. And then prevention, that, well, if we build a, a fence by that cliff where the people were falling off, we can keep them from falling into that river, but we have to understand and we have to help try to prevent. We can't afford over the next 20 years to take care of people like me we, we can't. There is not enough money to take care of everything that people like me need unless we start working with people now and on down to the minute they're born and even before. We can't afford to just treat the disease. We have to do work on prevention and find new and better ways. And one of the handouts that I put over here is from the CDC disparities report, and they call for a duality of action, one that is around prevention and one that is around treatment, and one that is for individuals, which is what most of us know, communicating with individuals, and the other is the kind of stuff that Judith does. So we're, we're a good pair here today, but getting a message out to mass audiences that moves them to do something. I can remember when polio was still around and we all got polio shots and there were ads on TV about doing that. We learned some things from that, but we're not doing good with mammography. So new ways and new strategies 
um, to get prevention messages out to people. And only then do we come to care, which is about treatment or getting people into care so we can treat them. And treatment there is, is mixed up with everything else that comes before it. How do people understand what their treatment is or what their options are? Um, how do they know how to get the treatments that they need? And then palliation, we're getting better at palliation. People with chronic disease or people with chronic pain, um, people who may not be gonna get better, but we can help them be as good as they can be. And then all the way through hospice and death. And so there are opportunities to make it a better system from way before awareness to all the way through to the last moment of people's lives. And that's what this committee can do. We have such brain power in this room to, to figure out what do we need to know in each one of those areas in order to reduce and eliminate disparities in Southwest Georgia, and then take those messages out to other people. Um, just another way to look at disparities by gender and education and treatment and access, sexual orientation is something that is a, is a huge area right now to understand the different needs of people who have differing sexual orientations and to create systems that work for them. What we have now may not work and we need to be aware of, of listening to them and understanding what kind of systems they need that will be good for them. Um, and then environmental. You know, Al Gore about bored me to death when he was vice president with climate change and environment. And I thought it was all about the air, the water, the soil, and how many trees are we cutting down. But we know in one of the handouts that I gave you is, is about social ecology. That the, if we look at the environment, yes, it is soil, water, air that we breathe, and another article that I gave you is on um, smog being related to um, babies being born too small. But environmental also means if the individual is at the core, what are their interpersonal relationships and how does that impact their health? Um, people who are smokers hang out with people who are smokers and it reinforces something that is deleterious to their health. So we want to be aware of that and our research can be in how do we surround people with something that's positive rather than negative. I tried something in my program class the other night. I asked them about the billboard that used to be on the street right outside and I pretended I was real dumb and said, you know, I remember it had like this blue velvet bag and it was something to do with some kind of liquor. Do you know what that kind of liquor is? And they were, oh yeah, Crown Royal. Because they had passed by that billboard so many times they even knew. And one person in my class said, oh yeah, I collect those blue bags. So environment is the individual and the things that surround them, their interpersonal relationships, what, are the, what is in their community, resources, as well as things that are bad. Is it safe to walk on the streets? Is there high crime? Are there street lights? Things like that. And then the policy issues. How can policy help to make people healthy? And how do we build our cities and our towns to encourage people to walk? Where are grocery stores located to allow people to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables that don't cost an arm and a leg? So environment is a huge issue if you think about it not only in terms of water, <coughs> soil, and air, and those are certainly huge issues, but lots of issues around where people live, especially vulnerable populations, and how that environment can affect their health. And then risk and protective factors. What I was talking about, what things actually make people unhealthy and what things make them healthy. Um, we can look at disparity from the individual, from the patient, as well as the provider stance, how we train our medical people, um, how uh, gifts to doctors from drug companies influence their practice patterns. 
Um, we were doing a program called Gateway to Care that helped people fill out their um, applications f to get medication from the drug companies for free, reduced cost. And um, the medicine could be shipped to the doctor's office where they, where they could pick it up. It would be shipped to their doctor's office and they could get it. And when we were putting that program together, we wanted to understand more about why people didn't go get their medicine when the doctor gave them a prescription. And I remember one woman that I interviewed said, I go to the doctor and all he does is give me a stack of prescriptions that I can't afford to get filled. And I take them home and I put them on top of my refrigerator. And I go back to my doctor the next month and he says, well, your cholesterol hasn't budged. I gave you the prescription for the medicine. Well, I'm gonna have to up the dose of that medicine for you. And I said, well, do you tell them that you can't afford to get the medicine? No. So there's lots of things around providers and their patterns of care and their individual beliefs and values, again, especially with vulnerable populations. Because I heard doctors tell me the exact opposite thing. Doctors said, well, I don't give them any of that expensive medicine because I know they can't get it. It might be best for them, but I'm, I can't, I'm not giving them a prescription for it because I know they're never going to be able to afford it. Or They have to take it four times a day, and they haven't, they haven't made an appointment at the first time we schedule it in years. So there's lots of provider issues. And then there's lots of system issues. The federal government is really invested in community health centers to make, um, to make healthcare available for vulnerable populations. But there's lots of other issues along from who do you see? Do you see your face when you walk in the front door? That has something to do with the system. Um, you know, we're trying to make it better with the Affordable Care Act and prevention, but we don't know yet. Where are all the other things? So lots of opportunities to change the system to make it better. And all of those things then go to healthcare use and how people are able to utilize services, always remembering that the individual has their own unique set of this service is valuable, this one isn't, this is something I believe works, this is something I don't believe works. And then all of these other areas for disparity research to identify populations who are at risk, to describe populations that are at risk, to kind of flesh out that picture to tell us more about them, to develop interventions for specialized groups. And remember what I said about the CDC, and they want a duality of, of approaches to health disparities, some for the individual, but also some interventions that are mass communications to get it out to particular groups all over the country or all over a state or a town that reaches out and, and touches more people to move them to action. To measure differences between groups, because what we think are differences, and if even if we think we know where those differences are, where they come from, they may not always be true. Um, lots of gaps in the data that exist in what we need to know to make a better system, and then to translate, you know, all those big words they used when I was in the hospital that I had no idea the stuff existed. How do you take that and you and teach? providers, from nurses who have the most contact with patients, all the way through the top specialists in the field. How do you translate it for them so it doesn't take 12 years, which is the average length of time it takes from a discovery to get to a provider in the field? What methods will work for the providers to get them information that they can use quickly to change their practice patterns? And then the last one, to take that information and even disseminate it out to a wider audience. Um, big right now with it's fine to do research and you publish in some journal that nobody ever heard of and those journals probably maybe even are laying in your doctor's office on the coffee table a couple of years old but they're laying there for people to read but they got words this long well nobody knows what that means try going on and looking for clinical trials for a particular disease and and you don't know what the words mean it takes forever to understand the, the lingo and the jargon and the words. So how do you take that and make it something that is actionable? 
and I use that word a lot, actionable, because it doesn't do us any good if nobody can act on it. And this is that model. You have a handout on it where the individual absolutely is at the core. But then you have the other influences and multi-level interventions is the norm now. You can't just figure, well, we're going to talk to individuals or we're going to give them a brochure or a pamphlet and that's going to fix it, or a doctor's going to talk to their patients one-on-one -on -one and it's going to fix it. There have to be interventions to reinforce and support any information that the individual gets at each of those levels outside of the person. And when you can wrap it all together with policy that changes the way we do things, now you got something that has some punch on disparities. Okay, that's it. Thank you.